Welcome to the educational, Exceptional Educators Playbook. I'm Doug Smith uh, with Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative, a uh, behavior consultant. Joined today uh, by Ms. Chastity Kreft, which is the literacy person at uh, uh, KVEC. We're also joined together by a couple special guests with us, uh, Master James Daly from uh, Lee County uh, Schools. He is the, uh, what was, it, was it, Dean of Students, and Miss Christiana Rush from Perry County Schools, which is uh, the uh, District Health Coordinator, is that correct? And also, uh, what was uh, what was the other one? <laughs> Introduce yourself. Behavior consultant. Behavior consultant. <laughs> and I should have known that. <laughs> I didn't know that. Well, I'll let them introduce themselves a little bit in a few minutes anyway, so we'll go on from there. But uh, uh, today's podcast, we're going to be talking about uh, PBIS, and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, PBIS on a school-wide basis, and we're going to be looking at PBIS uh, in a, a classroom setting. And we're also going to hit on a little bit about uh, maybe how to adapt check in and check out, which is a tier two strategy for behavior in a, a virtual setting. And uh, so what we're wanting to look at is each month we're going to be highlighting a different topic uh, or uh, to share with our educators and our teachers. And uh, each top each week our topic will be broken down into different uh, categories or content specific categories. Uh, First one is literacy with Miss Chastity Craft. First uh, Monday of each month. And then we'll be doing math with Miss uh, Bond Adams and Stephanie Kidd. And then behavior will be with myself. And then also uh, for the low incidence community, be with Miss Cheryl Mathis. Uh, the fourth Mondays of each month. Is that correct? That is correct. Right. All right. Thank you. So, <laughs> and like I said, today we're going to be talking about Tier One PBIS and Tier Two uh, strategy of check in and check out. So we'll go ahead and get started, and I'll let our guest introduce themselves real quick. Uh, Ms. Chesty, do you have anything to say as far as uh, any questions, comments, or anything like that? Please drop those in the chat box. We'll be monitoring that, and uh, if you have any questions, we'll try to answer those as we go along. Uh, no, I think we can get these guests started. They've got a lot of useful information, so I'm excited to hear again what they have and share. So Excellent. All right, either one of you, it doesn't matter. Ladies first, Miss Chris, you want to introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about where you're from and, and what you do briefly, and then we'll get Mr. Daly and then we'll rock and roll. Sure, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Chris Rush and I work for Perry County Schools. I've been in the school system for the last 18 years. At, um, First, the behavior consultant doing FBAs, working with our PBIS program, um, and a variety of other um, activities related to behavior. Uh, most recently, I have been uh, taking on the responsibilities of the district health coordinator for about the last three years. I have a degree in um, a master's in social work from the University of Kentucky. Spent my first 11 years of my career at Kentucky River Community Care where I did school-based mental health, um, as well as some administrative work. And I have three adult children who are all in college, and I like to say that they have given me more experience and uh, stretched my thoughts regarding behavior more so than any curriculum or job experience I've had. So, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. James, Mr. Dyer. Uh, my name is James Daly. I am from the Lee County School District. I've been teaching with Lee County for 14 years now. 12 years I spent in the fifth grade setting where I've taught all content areas. Uh, last year I moved down to second grade and got a year of experience or almost a year of experience uh, with second grade teaching. <coughs> Excuse me, most recently uh, I have taking on the responsibility of Dean of Students for our elementary school to help uh, establish our virtual learning um, academy and to assist our students with virtual learning needs. And then also I am our uh, school coordinator for PBIS. Uh, thank you. Glad to, have, uh, glad to have both of you with us today. Appreciate you. Uh, so I guess the first question is, what is PBIS? Ms. Rush, you want to go first? Okay, sure. Thank you, Jay. PBIS is a data-driven, systematic approach to look at behavior um, at different levels within a school system. And um, the first level, or the universal level, 
covers every student, every area in the school system. And the ideas behind that is that you are able to predict where the behaviors will, will occur, um, make a plan around the data or the issues within the school so that you can prevent the behaviors from occurring, and then um, be really consistent in the things that you expect from the students in modeling the behaviors that you want, um, and then evaluating how all of the efforts to mitigate the behavior issues, um, how they're working. And hopefully by doing this, you can filter through and find the students who need more interventions um, or more services so that you can provide an extra layer for them. And I, I really like what Ms. Rush said there about it being data driven. I know in uh, in our personal school system uh, at the elementary school level here, we use Infinite Campus to determine uh, our greatest needs for behavior modification because um, we use the data provided from Infinite Campus when uh, we have uh, referrals, whether it be from the bus or from the cafeteria, you know, we look at the number of referrals that a student has. We look at a number of times that the student has been uh, sent to the office. We look at a, a number of uh, times that students have had a negative interaction with teachers uh, in the building. <clears throat> and that's what drives our, uh, our focus or how can we best suit the needs of those students who are falling behind behaviorally? So I, I really like that, you know, you brought to the foreground that it is uh, very much data driven. And, you know, you, you mentioned uh, expectations there and teaching expectations. And I really like that too, you know, because if you think about it, you know, when, uh, when a, a child doesn't know how to swim, what do we do? We teach them, you know, when a child, doesn't know how to tie their shoe, you know, we teach them a number of life skills we spend teaching our children how, but oftentimes when it comes to behavior, the first thing that comes to mind is punishment, you know, and if students don't have that expectations and, and they've not, uh, they've not been accustomed to what positive behavior looks like, you know, rather than just punishing them, we need to teach those expectations to the students that we service. Uh, and uh, I, like, I like that you brought up teaching the expectations. So uh, next question, and I, I guess we'll lead into the next question, but whatever. Uh, so what does it mean to be a PBIS school? You know, some, if you can, both of you, either one, whoever wants to go first, it'd be great. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, for us, being a PBIS school means that we really focus on the positive behaviors that we want our students to exhibit at every grade level. And so what we've done is uh, we've determined uh, what we call the behavior matrix, which means that we've taken a look at all of our common areas where students gather, whether it's the gymnasium, whether it is the, uh, the lunchroom, the bathrooms, the hallway. Um, we have looked at our bus expectations for our students. We've looked at, you know, playground expectations, uh, enrichment class expectations, and even the, the normal classroom expectations. And we tried to develop a matrix in which behavior across those areas are consistent. So it doesn't matter if they are kindergarten or fifth grade. It doesn't matter if they are in my classroom or they are in one of our fifth grade teachers classrooms, then the expectations of what positive behavior is, is going to be the same throughout and it's going to be consistently taught, consistently enforced. And, you know, our, our staff really works on uh, teaching those expectations and modeling what appropriate behavior should be. Awesome job. And Jay did a great job of summing that up and giving some really specific examples. And I'd just like to add that it's really just using a strength-based approach. That when you look at what's occurring in your school, you look towards the strengths and the good things and you build on those. And um, an overall thing that we like to repeat in Perry County Schools is when speaking about PDIS, 
keep in mind when we're thinking about students and their behavior is what can we do for the student, not what can we do to the student. And often in education, it's really easy to feel um, that you need to do something. You know, there needs to be a demonstration that you're correcting the behavior. And PBIS gives you, it allows you to step back and think about the behavior through a different lens. Uh, and, and I like the way you, you put that because, you know, with, with a lot of, not a lot, of, but some focus on uh, looking at traumatic experiences and adverse childhood experiences that our students have been faced with and what they're going through now. If you're looking at that, like you mentioned, uh, Ms. Chris, through a trauma lens, I guess you could call it, what can we do to help you, not what can we do to punish you or what can we do for, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, like I said, as punishment. So you, you mentioned uh, the word consistency. And I, I really like that point because, you know, with anything, you have to be consistent. you got to stick with it. Uh, and so was it difficult to have buy-in from all the staff members and in, into getting into the, uh, getting a PBIS system in place? And, uh, speaking in regards to the county and the district that I work in, we <coughs> had some difficulty with that. One of the big obstacles that we have faced, and we're a pretty decent sized district, is we've had a lot of turnover. Mm -hmm. So you may have buy-in from one school, you may not have buy-in from another. Um, it's been really interesting because one of the teachers early on, well, actually an administrator or principal of one of their schools, he wasn't really sold on the program, but he implemented it anyway. And after the first year, he said, I'm sold. He said, yeah, wow. small school, we don't have a lot of behavior issues, but I see the difference it's made in addition to just managing <clears throat> in the culture and climate at school. So um, it, it's extremely important to have that buy-in and extremely important to be consistent with the way you implement it. You know, and, and I really like what you brought up there because, you know, it's the same with, um, with our district. You know, we have, our district is small enough that we only have one elementary school. We have one middle high school combined. And uh, our middle high school actually were the first to roll out PBIS and implement the PBIS system. So when it trickled down to us, you know, there was a little bit of resistance among some of the more seasoned staff members because, you know, you know how it is in the educational setting. A lot of times things that come along the pipeline, you know, they think, well, if we wait long enough, this is going to pass, you know, because a lot of initiatives are usually one year or, you know, six months to a year at most and then they kind of go by the wayside. So PBIS was viewed in that same capacity initially. But then once we decided that we were going to implement PBIS as a school-wide initiative, and uh, all of the teachers did come on board, you know, and say that this is how we are going to approach it. This is what we plan to do. And we got a little bit of that buy-in. Well, within the first month, we saw the, uh, the number of referrals and the number of uh, behavior incidences, you know, dramatically decrease. And so, you know, then that started to create that buy-in that, hey, this isn't something that is, you know, necessarily a waste of time, but, but they started to see the merit and the value uh, in that. And so then, you know, once they saw the merit and the value, then we saw the, the shift to more consistency and more fidelity. Uh, so, uh, and I guess kind of turn the page a little bit or whatever, we, we, all of us, well, not all of us, but the majority of us are doing either, uh, you know, part in-person classes, virtual classes, you know, computer, things like that. How could you apply your PBIS tier one strategy school-wide or, you know, large scale to a virtual setting? And what are some challenges you've seen there and what are some ways that you've overcome some of those challenges? James, if okay. you don't care. Okay, I'll go ahead and I'll speak first for that. <laughs> um, we've been completely in a virtual learning environment since the beginning of the year. Uh, I think we had a total of eight days about the first part of September where we actually had in-person classes with students. And then after those eight days, we've been, you know, completely remote learning again. So uh, some of the things that we've done were just to apply the PBIS strategies of teaching those common expectations to the virtual learning environment, you know, talking about, well, what is, uh, 
what is the expectations for virtual learning? You know, making sure that you are online, checking your classes for your assignments, making sure that you're turning your assignments in. Uh, we initiated um, mandatory Google Meets and Zoom sessions, you know, to get students uh, more focused on the learning process and, and um, getting student engagement increased. So, you know, we had that conversation with our kids too. Uh, through meetings and uh, personal phone calls talking about, you know, how the expectation is that they attend that Zoom session. And then, you know, we started doing exactly what PBIS is about rewarding that positive behavior. You know, for the smaller kids, it's extrinsic stuff, you know, whether it was a certificate that we could send them in the mail through for a free ice cream or, you know, something like that. So now it's become more of an intrinsic motivation uh, along with our older um, third, fourth, fifth grade students, you know, but just building that. And, and at first we were seeing, you know, a capacity of about 30%, 40%, 50% student engagement with those in sessions. But then once, you know, those, uh, that consistent set of expectations was laid down and, and fundamentally grounded, then, you know, we saw an increase. I think our fourth grade, you know, had 96% attendance on their Zoom sessions, you know, which I think is phenomenal. So, you know, PBIS, whether in person or whether virtual, you know, it, it has its benefits and it has its merits. So getting those expectations uh, related to students. And I, and I like the way you said that, uh, I'll jump in there before you do, Miss Chris, uh, the way you said that, uh, you know, you had to teach them the platform that you were using, but you also had to teach the kids how to log on, how to submit their, their, their responses, how to interact with that platform. For instance, we use Zoom quite often, uh, Google, what is it, Meets, uh, you know, uh, Teams, things like that. So that, that's very important that you, not only you covered in the, ex or, or told them expectations that you had, but you modeled those, taught those, and then retaught those as needed. So yes, very good, good job, awesome point. Thank you, Miss Chris. Yeah, really impressed at what y'all are doing in your district, Jay. Um, in our district, we have had only a few days of in-person class, um, much like most of the districts in um, Kentucky, uh, and we did a hybrid model for quite a while. And we did face some challenges, but to work through some of those and to make sure kids were getting some of um, that positive culture climate, even through virtual learning. We worked with our special teachers, our PE teachers and um, other special class teachers to help implement a social emotional learning curriculums. Yeah. And we've got a couple that our district um, are using. And as well, some of our teachers have hosted Halloween parties online, they do brain breaks. And even though now our district has chosen to not have classes period for, um, for a while so that we can try to later, um, hopefully have more in-person days, mm -hmm. we have teachers and staff that are checking in regularly with our students just to make sure that in regards to mental health and engagement, we're staying in touch with them. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I like the, the fact that you're still trying to keep that that relationship, that positive relationship with those kids, especially some of the ones that we know that struggle at this time. And also you're, you're helping build not only that relationship with the individual students, but you're building that relationship with those families as well, Absolutely. which, you know, they need, they need that help and support at this time, uh, you know, as if, go ahead. I started to say, you know, into it, it helps a whole lot having the support from your district, like you were talking about, you know, with Perry County adopting a couple of different, you know, behavior curriculums and, you know, really trying to implement this. And it's the same way with our district, you know, from our superintendent all the way down to our building administrators, you know, everybody is on board with this because it's all about the kids, you know, and, and that's, that's the thing about it because, uh, if you're doing something that's not going to benefit your students academically or behavior, behaviorally, then there's no sense in wasting time with it, you know, but this is something that has value everyone in our district from our board members uh, and from our district administration right on down, they see the value in this, you know, so they are very supportive in that as well. Right. Absolutely. And I just like to add that 
30 years ago when I started my career as a school-based therapist, uh, bringing this train of thought into the school system was a little bit challenging. You know, you had a few people that would jump on board and they, they got it. Um, but we are very fortunate now that, like you said, our district leadership team, our superintendent who has worked in day treatments, um, behavioral health um, projects throughout his career, they're all really supportive and to implement a positive um, or a successful PBS program, it, that's really necessary from the top down. All right, so I think we've covered a little bit about school-wide. Let's look at classroom-wide uh, uh, real quick. I think uh, according to uh, what is it, Midwest PBIS, there's six uh, classroom practices uh, that uh, they recommend, which talks about the arrangement of the physical environment or teaching matrix, which is not really a practice, but I think we covered that a little bit about teaching your expectations, your routines, uh, your procedures, uh, active supervision, encouraging appropriate behaviors, uh, continuum of responses, engagement opportunities to respond. So. Uh, I, th I know, Mr. Daly, you came out of a classroom uh, not too long ago, so if you want to address those first, uh, how, how would you apply using these six classroom practices in a virtual setting and, and as well as, you know, in person and in a virtual setting? So what are some strategies you could use? Well, I, I started to say, uh, let's let's talk about the in-person classroom first, you know, because last year, uh, one of the big things was <coughs> just establishing that uh, set of rituals and routines and making sure that you go over that consistently each day. So, you know, it's not just you create a classroom of, you know, 15, 20 rules or something like that. You know, you pick, uh, PBIS says that you choose, you know, five to six maybe rules, six at the most, that uh, you would feel like would benefit your students the most, you know. And then of course you just go back and you consistently teach and you consistently reinforce those those classroom rules. And, um, you know, like for us, we were talking about bus room or bus expectations, you know, how we expect our students to behave on the bus. So our uh, transportation director, he brought a bus out here to the elementary school. We scheduled times per grade level where we took our classes one classroom at a time, took them on the bus, sat them down and modeled you know, with them exactly what appropriate bus behavior should look like. So I feel like it's, you know, really giving those kids that that structure and, and showing them and modeling those expectations is the most important component of building PBIS in the physical environment. And again, it's going to be the same way with the virtual learning, you know, uh, from knowing how to, like Doug mentioned a moment ago, you know, knowing what platform you're using to present material to your students, teaching them how to navigate that, teaching them, you know, uh, to make sure to check their assignments, how to participate in those Google Meets, you know, building, just building that set of routines that you want from your kids, modeling that, constantly going back and reviewing and reinforcing, I think is the biggest uh, proponent of what makes PBIS so successful. All right, thank you. All right, we're. It's okay with me. Well, you all right? Go a couple yeah, minutes yeah. over. All right, cool, good. Uh, yeah, so this is good stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, thanks, my, thank to thanks to my guest. Make me look like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, okay, uh, one of one of the things uh, briefly that I'll hit on, but first off, let's let's talk about, we've addressed some barriers that you encountered as far as implementing PBIS class or school-wide and also some barriers maybe class-wide because you're gonna have, like you said earlier, some staff members are gonna buy into it rather quickly and some of our other staff members have a difficult time. What are some ways, uh, James and Chris, uh, both that you could uh, encourage maybe all staff members to uh, implement PBIS with fidelity. You know, how, how can you encourage, for instance, you know, I'm, I'm old school, I'm going to do things the way I want to do. How would you encourage me to get on board and, and to participate uh, with this program, with this, not program, but this system of uh, interventions for our students? Well, one of the big benefits to staff, Doug, is that you have to front load a little bit, but it pays off in the end for administrators dealing with behaviors for teachers inside the classroom, 
you have to put some things in place and it's a little bit of work um, on the front end, but you have less behavior issues and you can concentrate on the things that really are the most important within the class. And the other big sale that sometimes I don't think we, and we really pay enough attention to is, and I'm speaking from a parent perspective here, right. kids come home from school every day, they talk about what school was like. If my kids are telling me how uncomfortable school is or the negative things about school, and it doesn't sound like a happy, fun place for them, then as a parent, I'm not gonna be as supportive. But when they're coming home telling me, and, and it's easy to understand that the school is doing everything they can to make them successful, and that it's a welcoming, positive atmosphere, then I'm gonna be so much more supportive and engaged with that system. Thank you. And you know, too, getting your staff to, to buy into the PBIS system, one of the things that uh, we did is, it goes back to team development, you know, knowing who the right people are for your team. And the way that we structured our PBIS team for our school uh, was to have one teacher per grade level uh, to be a representative, you know, because the needs of a kindergarten student are so much different than what the needs are of a fourth or a fifth grade student, you know. So having a teacher from each grade level be a part of your PBIS team, I think um, really helps a lot because, you know, they feel like they have a, a personal stake at each grade level, you know, and there's a voice at each grade level to express concerns. And, and that's a, a lot of what it goes back to, you know. It's, it's hard to accept a program or to accept a system when you feel like you have no voice, you know, in the way that that system is implemented. So having that grade level, grade level representative uh, to speak on behalf of what each grade level needs, I, I think was really a positive uh, factor for the implementation of PBIS in our school. Absolutely, such a good point. And I think uh, just an idea, or just my opinion, or thoughts on it. I guess you could say you you want to reward your staff for for acknowledging the positive behaviors, just like you would uh, acknowledge Absolutely. and reward their students for exhibiting those positive behaviors and and building those relationships and uh, and uh, uh, providing for those uh, supports to our students. Uh, cool. So uh, so the benefits of PBAs. What, what do you think, just briefly, what are a couple of benefits of PBIS and implementation? I know it's drastically reduced the number of negative behavior incidences that we've had in our school, you know, and of course it's made teachers more excited because, you know, they feel like that, you know, we're finally getting to the root of the problem that, uh, you know, our students are coming from so many diverse home settings, you know, they come from split families and broken families and, you know, um, poverty circumstances and you know that's the wonderful thing about a PBIS system you know regardless of your background you know we are creating a system to support you so it's very individualized you know and uh, and you're you're really focusing on what the students need the most and so I feel like that you know as far as the the staff goes with that. When we saw that data after the first month and we saw that, you know, there was a, a decrease in the number of referrals and in the number of office visits, you know, for some students and the number of, of um, incidences out on playgrounds and things like that, you know, but the, I think that really was a true testament to how much of an impact PBIS has uh, in the school system. And I'll just add to that because you did that beautifully, but the psychological safety that it creates for the student, which enables Absolutely. them to be more prepared to learn. And, and I think too, just from my uh, experiences, building those positive relationships with, with uh, students, you know, I think with our trauma impacted students or kids, you know, one, one caring, one positive, one corrective relationship with a, an adult that does pay them attention and provides them with that that uh, uh, care and, and shows them that they are happy that they're there 
as a goes a long way in building resiliency and in the things that they struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, cool, awesome. You know, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to no, go ahead. there, but you know, there, the quote, there's a quote that says, you know, that students aren't going to care about what you teach until they know that you care. And that's a way that, you know, PBIS really builds those positive relationships that you were talking about, you know, because the students feel safe. They feel uh, included, you know, and once they know that you care about them, then they're going to take more of an interest in the academic side. So, you know, behavior and academics, they go hand in hand. And once you get one um, moving in the right direction, then the other follows. Right. That's, that's, that's a very good point. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Uh, so, I'll, uh, Thank y'all. I'm, I'm going to briefly hit on check in and check out, which is a tier two intervention. I'm going to be real brief because Miss Chastity's got a, 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 an announcement to make for us and she's going to end this show. She just did not know that. Uh, yeah, she was ready for it because last time did. But anyway, so we'll check in and check out is a way for students, <laughs> students to check in with a, an adult or a staff member at the school each morning. They get a, a point card or a behavior uh, school card, whatever you want to call it. But anyway, it's a card and they carry it with them and it has their expectations that they're working on throughout the day. And they have each teacher to sign that card at the end of each class period and they rate them zero, you know, uh, one or two. And then uh, they have so many points they, they collect at the end of the day and then they check out with that same person they checked in with in the mornings. You can still do this virtually. Uh, which you, you could use breakout rooms, maybe you could use chat, you could use different ways to implement that virtually. You could also teach the parents how to use check in and check out a brief tutorial with them. That way the student could maybe uh, have a, a or their rating or their point card could be, you know, did I log in on time? Did I attempt the classwork? Did I participate in class? Uh, did I respond to my teachers? Did I finish my work? Did I, you know, things like that, which are just great, just minors, minor uh, adaptations to the point card. And then at the end of the day, check out with that parent and talk with the teacher and then let them know, yeah, this is how I did. I earned this reward and what would that reward be? And for a home setting, a reward could be maybe, you know, uh, this is uh, something we, I get to watch on TV tonight or I get a few extra minutes computer time or or, you know, we're all behind a computer all day long, so maybe a few extra minutes outside time, or, or you know, something like that, something that the parents could implement and could reward the students with. And as far as looking for rewards or incentives, the parents are the ones that are with those kids during the day, so they know what is rewarding to them. They know what they'll work for, so that's just a, a way that you could do that. I also dropped into our, as a Google Classroom, uh, a, 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 a handout or informational material from pbis.org called guidance on adapt and check in and check out for distance learning so and there's some other materials in there as well from our, our previous podcast uh yeah. so those are those materials are there available and uh I, i'd like to thank both of y'all this has been really easy for me uh so i let miss chastity take us to the close if she likes she's got an announcement to make and Appreciate a couple of things, just building positive relationships. And I think both of you stress consistency. Make sure that you're consistent in implementation, consistent in your behavior with the students and how you interact with them. And point out the positive, because like you both said, if all you see is a negative, that's all you're gonna get. And we gotta build those relationships and help build those kids up with the positive, corrective relationships. Thank you both, I appreciate you very much. Thank you. No, I don't leave yet. Oh no, you can't leave yet. <laughs> Ms. Chastity said no. <laughs> uh, just thank you, thank you everybody for joining us for today for this week's session of Educational Educators Playbook. I have a hard time with that. It's sick. It's, I, okay. I have a hard time with that one. Exceptional uh, Educators I Playbook. I have just, I have just sat here though. I have been blown away by, I'm so impressed by the information oh, yeah. that these guys and gals uh, have shared with us. I mean, it's just, wow, such valuable information. I'm excited that we learned about hearing about those PBIS strategies for your school and class, virtual and in person. That's a lot of information. But one thing I especially loved, and I kept taking notes here, was again, you had mentioned it the consistency. 
and the expectations play such a key role in that. And I liked how James had mentioned, you get all staff members involved, your custodial staff, your bus drivers, the cafeteria, uh, that's what makes it so successful. So I love that you pointed that out. Uh, that, that's just awesome. Um, if you have, if you want some uh, deeper understanding about those resources, uh, go to the Google Classroom that Doug had actually just mentioned. There's a class code. It's W O K F F R five, and that is the class code for the Google Classroom. You can also email Mr. Smith at Doug.Smith at theholler.org, and last certainly not least. I have an exciting announcement to make. We have just launched a new Facebook and Instagram page uh, and that is just to help. With, we want to have a link to our Google site that has all the resources for uh, literacy, math, behavior, uh, new teacher, micro-credential, just anything that you would need. We have a link to those sites. You, we also will have the link for our uh, podcast and, and just all, anything, anything we got going on, it's there. So we encourage you to like our page um, on Instagram. It's KVECEC. Um, if you want to post, use hashtag KVEC EC. And then on Facebook, it's the Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative for Exceptional Children. So um, we would love it if you would just follow us and like our page on that. And then that will also help you with um, getting some updates and things like that as well. We hope that you can join us uh, next month as we talk about explicit instruction. And um, I think that is all the info I have. So until next time, we'll holler at you later. We'll holler at you later. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate y'all. Awesome.